Those of you who, like me, spend too much of your time circling the drain of film Twitter might remember a semi-viral tweet about the new Mortal Kombat movie. The tweet criticized the film's 1 hour and 50 minute runtime as being far too short to sufficiently cover the property's many characters. This isn't just two monsters fighting after all, but a deeply layered world with intricate backstory and lore. Most people who shared the tweet poked fun at this sentiment because, well, it's Mortal Kombat, and treating the material like it's Hamlet and not a video game adaptation about spines being ripped out is pretty funny. Kano wins, you fucking beauty. But you know, I have a certain respect for the attitude displayed here. I don't buy that Mortal Kombat demands an epic runtime to properly convey the story's nuances, but I kind of admire the earnestness of the argument. This tweet shows a love for Mortal Kombat, and a desire for the film adaptation to be as good as it possibly can be. At the very least, I greatly prefer a line of reasoning which advocates for more out of movie runtimes rather than less. Because the far more common argument I see online is that long movies are actually inherently bad. That any movie which qualifies as long, which can be defined as 3 plus hours to just anything past 90 minutes depending on who's talking, must justify why it needs to take up so much of a viewer's time. There are a couple of think pieces on this topic, but the primary platform this argument manifests is on Twitter, along with never-ending discourse about if old movies are boring, and should movies have sex scenes. I find this disdain for film length very depressing, and not just because a lot of my personal favorites have rather girthy runtimes. But my objection doesn't come from Barry Lyndon or The Irishman being inassailable masterpieces, so much as it does the way the online film community seems to value, or not value, movies. A reoccurring trend in the objection to the very idea of long movies is an attitude which sees runtime as equivalent to calories from a diet, something that is innately harmful and should be cut at all costs. And that just feels weird to me. Like, to love film so much that it shapes a large portion of your personality, but also want to spend as little time as possible actually watching movies. As if film going is a burden imposed and not a passion and hobby chosen for oneself. Moreover, I don't buy this premise that a long running time is inherently a bad thing to be avoided except when absolutely necessary. Quite the contrary, taking the time to really expand a story and characters can often greatly enrich what a film is capable of. Not to mention, getting to spend that much more time in a movie you really love is one of filmgoing's greatest pleasures. Put simply, long movies are good, actually. And speaking of long runtimes being a good thing, let's stretch out this video's length by talking about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in all manner of subject, available to anyone interested in learning something new. For anyone with a passion for filmmaking, which I imagine is a decent portion of my audience, I'd highly recommend Zach Mulligan's class, Cinematography Basics, Understanding Filmmaking Style. Mulligan covers a lot of the fundamentals of good image making, the nitty gritty of working with a director, and he also outlines the ways in which the role of cinematographer is different across jobs such as narrative film versus commercials. Skillshare is also ad-free, and as a special bonus offer, the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description will get a free one-month trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Whether you're a pro looking to sharpen your skills, or a novice striking up a new hobby, Skillshare has got you covered. Now before I get into why I love long movies, some caveats. First, I should stress that I am not saying short movies are bad. I absolutely appreciate the value of tight, economic storytelling, which manages to deliver a fulfilling cinematic experience in 90 minutes or less. I've recently been re-watching old Marx Brothers movies, and it's frankly amazing how much blistering comedy the boys are able to pack into just over an hour. And that's pretty great, in part because, like low-fat snacks, I don't feel bad when I devour a lot of them in one sitting. Second, I also get how long run times can be really intimidating. I've been casually marathoning some of the early films of Kenji Mitsuguchi lately, and been stalled by the 47 Ronin, given it's technically two films clocking in at four hours, 
and I want to make sure I have the time to give it a fair shake when I do sit down to watch it. And third, I have certainly been guilty of criticizing movie length in the past. Just last May, The lusty month of May. I complained on Letterboxd about the 1967 musical Camelot and its bloated, rambling three-hour runtime. The thing is, this is ultimately a pretty superficial observation. It's easy to point to the film's length and say, that's the problem, but my real issues lie in thin characters, weak conflict, and a general lack of scope for an Arthurian epic. A shorter version of Camelot might be more tolerable to me, but it wouldn't actually address what I don't like about the film. In this sense, the trend of railing against long running times is not dissimilar to the nitpicky obsession with plot holes, an often substanceless critique which highlights surface elements of a text as the problem that usually mask deeper issues. Both strands of criticism also place central importance on a movie's plot. The typical justification for length-based film critique is that X movie doesn't need to be that long. A shorter version of Camelot might not be any better, but does a frivolous musical really need to be three hours? But while I do value good economic storytelling, I think it's a mistake to assume the most economic way of relaying a film's plot is also the best way. Surely, movies offer more than just the most efficient delivery of plot points. Look at The Night of the Hunter, which, at 90 minutes, is unlikely to be described as too long, but it does have superfluous scenes from a plotting perspective. After the children escape by a boat from murderous preacher Harry Powell, the film lingers on for another minute and a half as the pair descend downriver, shrouded in darkness, dwarfed in the framing by a natural world, equal parts wondrous and frightening. And as Walter Schumann's score drifts into a trance-like haze, young Pearl sings a haunting little lullaby. Once upon a time there was a pretty fly. This might just be my favorite scene in the movie, a dark interlude which quietly stews in how hostile this world is to small things. But while rich in atmosphere and cinematic implication, the scene isn't all that important to the plot. It doesn't tell us anything we don't already know about the story or characters, and you could technically cut it from the movie and not really lose anything. But paradoxically, the film would be staggeringly lesser without it. But that's just 90 plotless seconds. What about when a movie stretches on for hours and hours with the thinnest of plots? Well. Let's talk about The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, a three-hour western epic with the thinnest plot imaginable. Three tough guys shoot at each other in the Old West while searching for buried treasure. You can't even say the length is to accommodate the in-depth characters, given the three leads are so transparently archetypes they can each be summed up by one simple word. The Good. The Bad. The ugly. Wait, this trailer makes it more confusing. Angel Eyes is the bad, not Tuco. Tuco's the ugly. See, it's actually essential Tuco be the ugly, given he represents a character caught between two extremes. Not a villain per se, but still touched by greed and violence. In many ways a reflection of the viewer's own ugliness. Mischievous and self-centered, but also deeply empathetic. I'm getting off topic. Point is, the good, the bad, and the ugly is really long, despite a bare-bones plot. Fitting this story within 90 minutes would have been perfectly feasible. Hell, you could probably tell it in 20. But it's Sergio Leone's excess and indulgence which makes the movie so special in the first place. Angel Eyes doesn't just interrogate and kill his victim. Leone transforms the scene into a masterclass in suspense, as power and information exchange back and forth before exploding into an almost apocalyptic violence. Angel Eyes emerges not just as the bad guy, but as a momentous force of evil. Tuco doesn't just betray Blondie, but subjects him to arduous torture through the desert, which whittles away body and spirit, as slow dissolves extend that time for what feels like an eternity. I have never been able to watch this scene without feeling desperately thirsty. 
It's the bizarre diversions, the desire to stretch scenes to their absolute breaking point that allows the film to transcend its rather basic plot. By the time Tuco is sprinting through tombstones desperately searching for the name of Arch Stanton, the seemingly basic story has evolved into something far more epic, and that's purely the result of Leone's cinematic exuberance. For something a little more intricate, look at Fanny and Alexander. Now there are actually two different versions of this film, one that clocks in at a hefty 3 hours and 8 minutes, and the other which runs a nice and breezy 5 hours and 12 minutes. A sprawling epic concerning the extended Ekdal family in early 20th century Sweden, the film is told through the eyes of the titular children. The inciting incident of both versions is the death of Fanny and Alexander's father, Oscar, which plunges wife and mother Emily into depression, and shortly after, marriage to the Lutheran bishop Edvard Vergerus, who proves an authoritarian and an enemy to young Alexander. But while both cuts of the film communicate this story, they are not equally effective. In the three-hour version, the inciting incident is just that, the inciting incident, something which needs to occur so the central conflict of the story can come into play. But in the five-hour cut, Oscar's death is much more profound. This is in part because the longer version includes some key scenes with Oscar, Notably this wondrous bit between he and the children, where Oscar describes a magic chair. This little moment is rich in love and imagination, two qualities which, not coincidentally, are totally lacking in the bishop. This moment of warmth is certainly missed in the shorter cut, but the other factor is more simply the amount of time spent with Oscar in the first place. The three-hour cut sees Oscar die about an hour into the movie, and while certainly sad, the tragedy is really more for the characters than the audience. But in the five-hour cut, Oscar dies closer to the two-hour mark, and that extra hour makes a world of difference, as it allows us to not just understand Oscar's place within the Ekdal family, but to really feel it for ourselves. The weight he holds within the family, and to his children in particular, is so much more tangible. And consequently, his death is all the more devastating. And that feeling lingers long afterwards, with Oscar's spirit literally and figuratively haunting over the rest of the film, being all the more resonant because of the time we spent with him. So while Ingmar Bergman was able to cut his mammoth five-hour runtime into a far more approachable three, Fanny and Alexander also demonstrates why this short version remains a lesser compromise. But if we're talking about long movies that could provably be shorter, The King is certainly Seven Samurai. The core of the story is really an escapist yarn about heroes protecting the weak and downtrodden against evil bandits. Yet Akira Kurosawa's action adventure clocks in at a dense three and a half hours. And when I say it's been proven that the film could be shorter and still be successful, I do mean that literally, at least if you believe the two remakes. Three if you count A Bug's Life. Four if you count Battle Beyond the Stars. Uh, five if you count The Invincible Six. Six if you count The Seven Magnificent Gladiators. Quality across these movies varies, but each is able to take the basic template laid down by Kurosawa without needing to take up nearly as much time. And yeah, Seven Samurai, like Lawrence of Arabia, or Heat, or La Dolce Vita, or any of the long movies I've discussed here, could be shorter. <laughs> Question is, what do you cut out? It's easy to say a given movie is too long, or to haphazardly declare a movie could drop X amount of minutes and not lose anything, but what specifically are you willing to drop? With Seven Samurai, a lot does spring to mind. The battle scenes are pretty long, I guess, and we also spend a lot of time with the village scouting party watching samurai like Kambei and Kyuzo before the team is actually assembled, or with the samurai traveling back to the village before we actually get to our main setting again. The film also has a ton of named characters which clog up screen time, and Kurosawa also dives into a reflective class consciousness that isn't, strictly speaking, needed to tell a story about good guys fighting bad guys. But I cannot imagine the movie without these things. 
yeah, the battle scenes are long, but they also feature cutting-edge cinematic techniques, convey the arduous battle endured by the heroes along with the high cost of the villagers' freedom from tyranny, and are generally wickedly exciting to watch. Kambi and Kaiuso's introductory action scenes are diversions within the main plot, but they also demonstrate each character and their skills, so that we innately understand who they are. The breezy journey back to the village is also a nice interlude to spend with the heroes, and even offers a wonderful character moment for Kikuchio, who, initially rejected by the samurai, earns their respect by outfoxing them on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> in a scene which is elegantly staged and just plain fun. And yeah, there are a lot of characters. Not just the titular seven, who are obviously important, but several key villagers who end up being a major part of the film. Some have more bearing on the main plot than others, but the time Kurosawa gives to each makes them all rich and interesting figures, who make whatever extra minutes they warrant well worth it. The film's class consciousness largely emerges in a subplot involving how the villagers had previously killed unsuspecting samurai in the past, and the accusation that the samurai only have themselves to blame, given their own historical abuses of the peasantry. This doesn't have too much direct influence on the plot, but it is crucial to the film. Certainly to the ending, as that history makes the inevitable reinforcement of class divide all the more tragic. This innate critique of the assumed nobility of the samurai and ethics in warfare were especially relevant to Japan post-World War II, as the nation was coming to grips with both the ravages of war, along with their own complicity within said war effort. Indeed, this conflict speaks directly to Kurosawa's own anxieties, as someone who felt guilty for supporting the Japanese war machine. To lose that depth in history for the sake of a more streamlined story of good guys fighting bad guys would be incredibly short-sighted. This is at the core of why I find objection to long run times so weird. Placing so much emphasis on having the most streamlined and efficient plotting is like wanting to compress all your meals into pill form. You'd still get the same protein and nutrients, but without the details in texture and flavor, which make eating pleasurable in the first place. And movies should be pleasurable. I certainly don't want every film made to be a multi-hour epic which will take up my whole afternoon, but it's also exciting when filmmakers are given the time to really expand and enrich a story. When films offer more than just a tightly wound plot, but a deeper sense of a world and the people within it. At the very least, I can confidently say the case studies I've highlighted here gain exponentially from their runtimes, and I wouldn't want them any other way. And in case it needs to be said, no, not every film which crosses three hours is an automatic masterpiece, but if you find yourself bored during a particularly long movie, ask yourself if it's really the length you don't like. Because chances are, there's something more specific that isn't engaging you. Really, Roger Ebert said it best. No good movie is too long, and no bad movie is short enough.